Hi, I'm Shoma Chaudhary. Thank you for watching Inquiry. The high profile encounter of Vikas Dubey, a gangster in Uttar Pradesh, has raised questions and brought focus on the nexus between politics, crime, and the police in India. In another incident a few weeks ago, the brutal custodial death of a father and son, Jairaj in Phoenix in Tamil Nadu, brought attention to another phenomenon. There have been more than 1,600 custodial deaths in India in the last year alone and more than 3,000 encounters over the last three years in Uttar Pradesh. The anti-CA protests brought attention to other disturbing aspects of policing in India. There's been casteism, communalization, and partisan action. There's a disturbing breakdown of trust in the police force in India. So how can the police force be rescued? What are the reforms that are needed? And why are none of these incidents sufficient to create the kind of outrage that the George Floyd murder created in America. To discuss these issues, I have a very important guest at Inquiry today, Mr. Prakash Singh, a former DGP of police and the man who took the issue of police reforms to the Supreme Court and won a landmark judgment. Thank you very much for joining us, Mr. Singh. Thank you. So I'd like to start with the high profile encounter of the criminal Vikas Dubey that is making headlines right now. You know, it seems to be part of a larger growing acceptance of encounters as the norm. And you've been DGP of Uttar Pradesh, you've been pushing for police reform. What is your response uh, and perspective on this encounter? Well, I will sum that up in two words, uh, unfortunate and disappointing. I consider that unfortunate because uh, because Dubey had been uh, kept, if, if he had uh, not undergone this encounter and had remained alive, and he had been properly interrogated, I think uh, we would have uh, got information about the entire network of people who have been assisting him, uh, financing him, uh, patronizing him, or extending him protection. So it was very necessary that uh, this, this entire uh, nexus was exposed. Uh, disappointing because, you see, when you are uh, uh, escorting an officer, so, uh, a, a, a criminal so notorious, uh, then you are supposed to take a lot of precautions and ensure that, uh, I would say, A, uh, the eventuality of his escape simply does not arise because the security arrangements are so tight. And secondly, there should be no occasion for an encounter uh, subsequent to his attempt to escape. Yeah, but sir, as I said, this is part of a larger, pretty disturbing culture where encounters are just becoming the accepted norm and a kind of substitute for a judicial process. So, you know, you've had Chief Minister Aditya Yoginath uh, say that uh, it'll be a talk though culture in terms of his fight against crime. And the UP police have officially claimed more than a thousand encounters. Uh, 130 odd people have been killed in the last couple of years. And uh, the ADG of law and order, Anand Kumar, he said that encounters were in keeping with the desire of the government and the expectations of the people. So, you know, we're, we're really talking about a kind of vigilante culture taking over. And what would be your response to that? Is it not a matter of concern? About this talk though statement, maybe the Chief Minister said that, but uh, subsequently I definitely recall he, while giving interview to India Today, he definitely said that there is no uh, policy of encounters and that we are only dealing is very strictly with the, with the criminal elements, the lawless elements who have been uh, dodging the law so far. But he also made a statement, definitely I remember that, that there is no policy of encounters in the state. About Arvind so Kumar. That can be, sir, but uh, you know, there's a gap between the statement and, and action on ground. What I was asking you is that if there are 103 people shot in encounters rather than arrested, you know, you've been a police officer and you've really been pushing for police and, uh, reform. What is your opinion on encounters? In the first you see, place? as long as these encounters are followed by compliance of Supreme Court guidelines, and the mandatory inquiry, they have laid down about 10, 12 points which need to be followed up. So long as the Supreme Court guidelines have been followed up, I think uh, we should leave it at that. So forgive me for pushing this point further, but you know, there's an independent journalist called Neha Dixit who did a ground report on the encounters that have been taking place in Uttar Pradesh recently. And there were some very troubling aspects to it because there were many instances where the action taken report, the account of the encounter were in identical terms. Uh, many of them did not have, uh, you know, prehistory of any criminal records. Many of them were just very small, petty criminals. 
and there was a large percentage of Muslim and Dalit uh, youths who'd been bumped off. So there's a, you know, I mean, this seems a complete subversion of a judicial process because yes, there may be some dreaded criminals that are shot, but there could also be innocent people who are gunned down. And uh, so I would put it to you again, sir, that is there no aspect of this that you find disturbing? I am disturbed by encounters, but I'm more disturbed by the weakness of a criminal justice system, which is not able to book the culprits and which is not able to sentence them to adequate terms of imprisonment. In US, if something, I mean, even if something minor happens, I mean, much less uh, grave than the killing of eight policemen, you find the man has been sentenced to 120 years in prison for different offenses. Here, nothing of the kind happens. And uh, a man uh, uh, murders a minister within the premises of a police station, in the presence of policemen, and yet he's able to uh, get away and he's caught free and he's declared uh, not guilty. And how, how does that happen? How does that happen? Because, uh, I mean, there was a change of government, Samajwadi Party came to power, uh, and Samajwadi Party people ensured, they put pressure on the policemen to retract uh, their statements and go back on whatever they had seen. So, I mean, this is terrible. I mean, we have a criminal justice system which can be subverted by a corrupt regime, by a politicized regime, uh, which has nexus with criminals. And uh, actually, it is, the, it is the man in the street, the common man who suffers in the process. So, I mean, this culture of sort of approving encounters, you know what happened in Telangana. I mean, there was so much of Huawei for the Telangana encounter. I mean, it's technically wrong. But so much of why, after all, why are people so fed up with these criminals, uh, which they feel that the existing criminal justice system is not able to take care of? But so and, just, just to press on that point, you brought up the Hyderabad rape case of the, you know, the vet, veterinary doctor, and it was horrible what happened to her. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, the fact that so soon after some men were encountered and killed, so does it, as a police officer, of course, we'll come to the criminal justice system, but I'm talking about now the front line, you know, which is either arresting or nabbing criminals. There's no uh, due, if you have no due process, you don't know whether these were the correct criminals or were they not, were they the rapists, were they falsely arrested? There's no way of knowing. So what is the distinction between crime done by a state and crime done by a criminal uh, if there is no due process? So, is that a fair point? Do you agree with that? Crime done by a state and crime done by a criminal. Uh, <coughs> that is your way of putting things. Uh, I would say crime done by a criminal and then uh, harsh methods adopted by the state, which may amount to transgression of law, but harsh methods adopted by the state to uh, fix a criminal who otherwise they felt would get away. Uh, these criminals have to be, I mean, I mean in, the, in the larger interests of the society. I mean, uh, just recall Bhagalpur, bl Bhagalpur blindings. Yes, it was atrocious. You cannot justify it by any standards. But why is it that the people of Bhagalpur welcomed that? Why is it that the, the local officers were uh, fitted and uh, praised for uh, these blindings? See, I mean, this collapse of the criminal justice system, and Justice Malimat said this more than uh, 15 to 20 years back, that the criminal justice system is collapsed. I am disturbed by encounters, but I am more disturbed by the weakness of a criminal justice system, which is not able to book the culprits and which is not able to sentence them to something. And we are not doing anything about it. You are not interested in police reforms. You are not interested in judicial reforms. You are not interested in prison reforms. You are not interested in energizing the prosecuting branch. So what what, 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 what should happen? You have to go to the root of the problem. The root of the problem is what? We have a political system which is hand in glove with criminals. You see, as far back as 1993, Bora committee gave a report about nexus of uh, uh, politicians and criminals and uh, government functionaries. The director IB had clearly written in his report that uh, some kind of a parallel government is running in certain areas of the country and this is reducing the state to irrelevance. But ultimately, nothing came out of it. You see, we are permitting criminals to enter the parliament and the assembly. Uh, not only permitting them to enter, we their percentage, if you analyze during the last three general elections, the, their percentage is steadily going up. Now, this is a terrible situation. I mean, if, if it is not arrested, uh, we would qualify to be called a criminal state. Now, these M MLAs, what would they do in the districts? Tell me. Just try to imagine. 
दे विल से हमारा ये गलत काम कर दो डू दिस थिंग इन फेवर ऑफ माई स्टूज डू हेल्प मी इन गेटिंग दिस हेल्प मी इन ग्रेविंग दिस प्रॉपर्टी आई मीन ऑल काइंड ऑफ थिंग्स दे आर डूइंग एंड If the police does not do, uh, you you just get lost. I I know there are certain districts in UP today where the MLAs take monthly. You talk of hafta, they take monthly from the local SHO. They say, I mean, all right, sixty lakh, seventy lakhs, or whatever it is. You you give me that much uh, every month. Otherwise, you lose your job. Now there are two options before him. Either he prefers to be disgraced or he falls in the rut. Unfortunately, I mean, most of the people are falling in the rut. They say, "Give me a." When this is the system is like that, the government is like that, the representative people's representatives are like that. So, फिर हमने क्या ठेका ले ले रखा है सच्चाई का? And nobody is prepared to sort of tackle this problem. So, every chief election commissioner after retirement gives a statement to that to to that effect that these people should be debarred, but nobody debars him. And the when the matter is taken before the Supreme Court, Supreme Court says it is beyond our jurisdiction and it is uh, something which the government should uh, frame rules or law. in fact so that problem is only increasing in the 17th lok sabha which is the cu- current one there's 50% of parliamentarians have criminal records so that is just staggering and you know again we have to address that root problem that you are raising but right now we're talking in the context of repeated excesses of the police over the last few months so you know we've had that absolutely horrific case of the father and son jairaj and benix in tutikorin where they were arrested for not downing their shop shutters during lockdown and they were brutally tortured in in the cop station and then the magistrate sent them back to custody police custody and they were killed and you know there've been more than 1600 uh, sort of custodial deaths in just one year and uh, you know so th- if you're just talking about the front line sir which is police action there's a complete breakdown in trust in police I mean, if you take the anti-CA protests again, there was extremely partisan action by the police uh, in Muslim areas. You know, we saw damaging of property. We saw some videos where cops were with the mobs, uh, you know, pelting stones. We saw very partisan arrests of uh, students under UAPA and activists under UAPA. So, so if you were to just focus on the police for right now, where would you pinpoint the problem with the police? You see, you are uh, referring to the Tutikoron incident, where the father and son duo were brutally assaulted and beaten to death. Now, it was a very bad incident, absolutely unjustifiable, and the men concerned should be dealt with under appropriate sections of law and uh, prosecuted. There, there can be no two opinion about it. But, uh, but these are. I w- would you generalize this? Uh, let me tell you, Shoma. I mean, if you examine the working of police, I mean, I have been travelling across the country. I find if you talk to IPS officers. there is today a general aversion to use of force general aversion this is what i noticed during the haryana inquiry on the jat agitation i mean of such so many of such said sir aajkal hum log bal prayog nahi karte hain we don't use force and we avoid using force because we are not sure that the government would uphold our actions howsoever warranted and justified in a given situation and they play to the political gallery so there is a general aversion to use of force but the culture of a uh, custodial uh, brutal treatment continues why now here again you have to go to the root of the problem what what scientific gadgetry have you given to the police station you see if you take if you go to any forensic laboratory and ask them hey, what is your what is your pendency he will he will give a huge number and then he will also say that uh, exhibits are pending for one year or two years or three years Oh, scientific aids to investigation are just not available, and governments, state governments, are waking up to the need of uh, forensic laboratories only now. So, I mean, in the absence of scientific aids to investigation, they think that the only way to get confession out of a out of out of, out of a man in custody is to be beat him up, which is which is absolutely wrong. But things have to change, and the moment you, I mean, two things are going to bring about a revolutionary change in the working of the police. One, the greater induction of women in the police force. Uh, I mean, uh, women are also prone to. all the ills that uh, men are blamed but uh, but still they are more humane they are more compassionate and uh, they are more considerate so induction of women at the police station is going to bring about a revolutionary change and the other thing is forensic facilities being made available in every district uh, there there's a gradual move in that direction it's a slow move but uh, i mean if a district doesn't have a forensic lab you can have mobile uh, mobile vans which reach a police station uh, whenever there is a 
call whenever there's a need. So these things, but these things will take time. And this this culture of beating up people and custodial torture, sometimes leading to death, it is very unfortunate. It's very wrong. It's absolutely unjustifiable. But I think another five to ten years, this will be. I mean, you will hear less and less about such incidents. So we definitely need to focus on the difficulties that the police force themselves face. You know, as we've been speaking, there's the political pressure, there's the difficult conditions of their work, the public often hates and distrusts them, uh, and they're brutal in turn. So there are many dif difficult aspects to this. But I'd like to stick with the encounter issue a little longer, sir, because you seem to have a kind of tacit approval for it because the criminal ju judicial system is broken down. But there can be a lot of collateral damage arising out of this. You know, there was the story of the Apple executive Vinay Tiwari and uh, Sumit Gujar, who was mistakenly shot for another Sumit Gujar and a bounty of 50,000 that was raised on him retrospectively. So, you know, as these cases happen, there are increasing issues of lynch mobs and, you know, there's mayhem everywhere, sir. And uh, soon, you know, victims of families like Jairaj and Beenix's will want to take law into their own hands and seek revenge because what recourse do they have? I, I share your concern on these points. I mean, I, I'm not personally aware of the details, but I accept whatever details you have given me. And there are instances where police uh, abuses its authority and sometimes people who are not guilty, they also uh, get their offender to stick. It, it happens. If you recall the instructions given by the Supreme Court in, the, in their landmark judgment and police reforms was that there should be complaints authorities in every district and at every and at the state level. Now the problem is the states are not setting up these complaints authorities, and there has uh, there has been dilution of the Supreme Court directions and an attempt to sabotage. I, I'm waiting for the Supreme Court to wield the stick and uh, force the states to fall in line. These instructions were given in 2006. 14 years have gone by, and you have not complied with those directions. You you are finding fault with the police in the street police on the spot, police in the police station, but you are not going to the root of the problem. Why are Supreme Court directions not uh, followed? Why are we allowing uh, criminals to enter into parliament? Why are we allowing criminals to enter into assemblies? Why are we allowing uh, persons of questionable background to influence the day-to-day -day working of the police? And why have we allowed this nexus to grow and proliferate uh, uh, and become menacing for the, for, the, for the society? Yes, police is in bad shape, I is in very bad shape, but what to do? Are you interested in police reforms? I mean, not uh, Shoma, but uh, is the government interested in police reforms? So we've looked at, you know, custodial torture or, or false arrests of encounters. There's also the extreme politicization of the police force. So there's a communalization of the police force now. Uh, you know, again, UP has in that sense been the hotbed. Uh, Gujarat, Tamil Nadu, these are other particularly, uh, you know, states with bad track records. But if we stick with Uttar Pradesh now, because that's in the eye of the storm, that during the anti-CA protests, we saw police actually running with mobs, you know, or during the riots, we saw them running with mobs, uh, pelting Muslim homes or breaking down Muslim, particularly Muslim uh, localities. What has led to that level of communalization of the police? Sir? And is that an area that you are concerned about? See, I'm concerned about politicization. I'm also concerned about communalization. But let me tell you, politicization happens only when the political masters put that much pressure on the police officer. That either you uh, either you carry out our diktat or you get lost. Again, I take you back to Supreme Court direction. The, the first direction was that police should be insulated from external, all kinds of external pressures. Have we built that insulation? Again, we have not built that insulation. What form can that insulation take? My insulation was in the form of a state security commission. It will ensure that the state government does not interfere in the day-to-day -day functioning of the police. And B, it will also ensure that the police does not transgress the limits of law and its daily functioning. Now, here again, we find intellectual dishonesty of the state governments. Either they have either not constituted the state security commissions or they have packed it with their stooges. What do you do? What do you do? The, the most uh, laudable instructions are uh, contaminated and uh, they are devastated by, by having a body which, which will not be impartial, which will not be objective and which will be just be playing the tune of the government. Every time there is a change of government, you will find the 100, 100 odd, odd transfers take place of the district magistrates and the superintendent. So again, please go to the root of the problem. Yes, police is being politicized, but who is politicizing it? Then you talk of communalization. You see, you take any major incident of communal riot, go to the root of it again. It is the political direction which, which influenced the communal performance of the 
police in a given situation. I mean, Muzaffarnagar riots happened. Why did they happen? Because somebody in Lucknow wanted to say that if I am his name, write his name, write his So uh, one section of the people got aggrieved. They said, "What is this? The guilty are being uh, let out." So, they, so they took up arms and started uh, beating up the other community. When they don't get justice from the government, when they don't get justice from the police, so they said, "All right, now we'll take law in our own hands and we'll beat up the members of the other community." So these things happen. Yes, communalization is taking place, politicization is taking place, but we are not. We are just blaming. Uh, I mean, a group of people who are just play things in the hands of the state government. I mean, the highest officer, I mean, as DGP UP, I was given a, uh, just three hours notice to pack up and go. But this kind of thing happens uh, at all levels. Uh, this thing has to end. And uh, until so this, for, for uh, our audiences who, who won't know the circumstances of that, uh, would you spell it out just to explain what your own experience was? Well, it happened more than once. I mean, I was shunted out from the IG Merak. I was shunned. I had to. A situation was created where I had to leave. Uh, where I said I, I'm not prepared to function as DGPS. I'm now. Then a situation was created where I was uh, shown the door as DGP. These are long stories, but suffice it to say that there were political reasons. And what then, What were the kinds of things you were being asked to do, sir? It's a long story. <laughs> if I start, <laughs> if I start a merit episode, if I start a Sam episode, it will take one hour. So suffice it to say that the yes, reason that, that would be very important because that's like literally from you know a very respected police officer. It's from the I'm going, I'm going to record this in a book, and uh, you will see that uh, by by next year. So at least give us a small sneak preview, sir. What are the pressures that police face, and what is it that you were asked to do? For example, uh, DIG merit. I mean, I that was my first charge as a DIG range, and believe me, I took the my responsibilities with missionary zeal. That I have to clean up the police. In the process, I uh, I suspended a whole lot of SHOs who were doing wrong things, and uh, I told the SPs that look, if you are scared of uh, suspending a, an SHO, you tell him that these are uh, DIG's orders. So all the responsibility came to me, and as it turned out, uh, they were all of them were things uh, which made no uh, difference to me. I mean, I, th- I, 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 d- I had no clue what community they belonged to, but as it turned out, they were all jots. And then uh, it was conveyed to the Chief Minister. Uh, I mean, sorry, the Home Minister of India, Chaudhary Ch- Charan Singh, that sir, you have brought a DIG merit who is anti jot So he got very angry, and he said he called me to the North Block building. Uh, shouted at me. I stood my ground. I defended all my actions. And when I found that he was not listening to me, I just saluted and walked out. And by, before I reached merit, uh, orders of my transfer had been issued. So I mean, you get humiliated for doing the right things. I mean, even when you are working with the missionary zeal, with the crusading spirit, you find that you somehow you are on the wrong side of uh, politicians, and you get thrown out. Well, that was one story. DGP, DGP, Assam, or other stories. Hmm. Right. Who, who was in government in Assam when uh, you government were... Assam, you see, government in... You see, I was sent there during president's rule. Uh, and I was sent there to hold the elections because uh, Ulfa had threatened that they will not allow elections to be held. So they were looking for a DGP from a non-Assam cadre because they felt that uh, an uh, Assam cadre officer will not be able to go hammer and tongs against the Ulfa. So they, I was I had done by that time four years in Punjab in the thick of terrorism. So they said, this man has an, uh, enough experience of dealing with terrorism. Let him, uh, let us send him to uh, Assam. I went there, elections were held, peacefully held. Ulfa were not able to subvert uh, the elections. Uh, and But at the end of it, Hiteshwar Saikya came to power. And then he had his own way of working. He started interfering in the postings of the station officers. I said, I, I will not permit this. Session officers will be permitted, will be posted by the police officers, by the DGP and the, the lower uh, officers. Then he started releasing Ulfa detainees. Uh, in a stroke, he released uh, about 100 plus, then 200 plus. I said, sir, look, this, I mean, it has taken the Assam police months, years to arrest these people. And in one stroke of the pen, you are releasing them. He had his own political game. Hitesha Saiga was, I think, the cleverest chief minister I have seen in life. He would say one thing, he would mean something else, and he would do a third thing. Then I wrote a lengthy letter and I said, sorry, I'm, under these circumstances, I'm not prepared to serve in Assam. I may be relieved of my charge. I mean, I could have compromised and continued, but uh, no, I said no. So, sir, you've been a DG of police in UP, uh, and you've been watching it closely now. You've been pushing for reforms. Do you think that there's a further intensification and de- deterioration of the situation from say when you retired or would you say it's comparable? Yeah, things have gone bad. Things have gone bad. Uh, 
uh, you see, the, the more we have talked of reforms, I mean, to use a Marxist jargon, the counter-revolutionary forces uh, are strong and they are trying to assert their authority and ensure that reforms do not take place. So things have uh, continued to go bad. I mean, but about Yogi Adityanath, I mean, whatever you may say, let me tell you one thing, Shoma. He is the cleanest chief minister in the country today. He, you cannot accuse him of one paisa of uh, dishonesty. A, B, he has a no-nonsense attitude to, towards the criminals. No-nonsense attitude. And for that, he has given police full latitude. Yes, but how is that latitude to be utilized that he left to the police? He has been very supportive of the police. I think he has been more supportive of the police than, I have, than any chief minister that I have known in UP. But uh, unfortunately, some police officers have taken advantage of that. Some police officers have taken advantage of that. And one of the, uh, I mean, one of the very senior officers uh, during his tenure, I mean, I knew he did a lot of wrong things and I, I told him also that he's doing wrong things, but uh, I mean, I got the impression that there are so many other forces at work which prevent him from taking uh, the rightful action in certain situations. One has heard that he's not conventionally corrupt and that's very unusual and, uh, you know, I'm sure something to be grateful for. Uh, but would you accept, sir, that there's also been a lot of communalization of police uh, under him? And, uh, you know, one can argue that in the Malayam Singh era and uh, Akhilesh Yadav, it was the era of the Yadavs and then they ran amok. So every regime has its own connotation. But Mr. Uh, Yogi Adityanath has made a lot of communal statements. And during the anti-CA protests, one saw a lot of partisan action of the police in UP. You know, they uh, damaged property in Muslim areas. They put up faces of protesters on public hoardings, which was like a kind of signal for public retribution in that atmosphere. Uh, you know, there was the claiming of uh, financial damages for property that was uh, destroyed. And all these things have never happened before. So it seemed to be very partisan. And uh, would you not say that that's an area of concern? You see, it depends on uh, what kind of specs you're wearing. Uh, there was a different kind of communalization during uh, Akhilesh Yadav and Malayam Singh. Uh, there was a different kind of communalization when uh, Banji was in power. So it's all a question of perspective, which way you're looking at it. I mean, uh, when Samajwadi party was in power, believe me, as a former DGP of the state, I used to wonder at times, ki, if tomorrow something happens, something wrong with me happens and the person at the other end is a Samajwadi party follower, would I get justice in this state of Uttar Pradesh? And I could not say yes. I could not say yes. So, I mean, that was a different kind of communalization and the kind of corruption that we had uh, during Samajwadi party rule and Bahujan Samaj, that's, I mean, you can't imagine, you can't imagine uh, the amount of corruption. Uh, and the only difference in corruption with Samajwadi party and Bahujan was but Samajwadi party, it was decentralized corruption. Every district had somebody who would claim uh, link, uh, links with uh, Maram Singh or Akhilesh. Bahujan Samaj party, it was uh, centralized corruption and on a massive, massive scale. But this man has at least, he does not take a paisa. He does not want anybody else to take paisa, but there are, he's surrounded by corrupt people. Yeah, you were just mentioning that now the going rate is 60, 70 lakhs. Uh, for police uh, officers to retain their tenures also. Many wrong uh, kind of people have been posted as district superintendents of police. Why have they been posted? Not because Yogi Adityanath wanted them, but somebody else wanted them. Even a chief minister has limits to his power. Uh, see, we have a very complicated political system where all kinds of forces are, are at work locally, state level, from Delhi, all kinds of things. And the chief minister has to just balance his uh, role. I've seen him from very close quarters. He, he is an amazing person as an individual, an amazing person. You may, different, you may disagree with his ideology. That's one thing. But he's an amazing person and the cleanest chief minister in the country today. That's a huge endorsement coming from you, sir. But I also think that you're giving him a little bit of an easy ride because if you're a strong chief minister, then of course, corruption is one big thing. But there's certain things you shouldn't compromise on. And, uh, you know, he, as I mentioned, he himself has been making communal statements. Uh, but let, now let's come to the issue of police reforms. Uh, you know, you took a PIL to the Supreme Court and won a landmark judgment. So what prompted you to take that issue to court, sir? What was the trigger incident? Two things. My own frustrating experience that uh, I mean, for an officer who wants to follow the right path and enforce the rule of law, there are enormous difficulties in the way. Then there's one sentence which keeps on ringing in my mind to this day. A very honest IS officer, a man of very high integrity, Sham Singh Bisain, he was Home Secretary 
once while talking to him i, I was i mean i was agitated and i was talking to him because i knew that he is an honest man so i could unburden myself with him when he found that um, i was not amenable to the explanations he was giving he came out with what he thought would be his trump card he said prakash who wants an honest police officer now that sentence i have not been able to forget to this day who wants an honest police officer so i said i mean at the end of my career i said look uh, i mean i have put in 35 years of service in the police i mean i would like i mean this is an instrument if it becomes an instrument of service to the people what difference it would make to the to the huge uh, i mean the sea of humanity that you have in our, in our country just even one improvement will make a was different so i said why not agitate i mean why not take up the issue of police reform i took up six issues which i thought will touch the heart of the problem i went to the supreme court and i mean wonder of wonders and god's blessings i would say uh, all the six points were conceded I mean, so which are the six points sir i'll have to very i'll have to be very brief state security commission one state security commission to insulate police from external pressures police establishment board to give police uh, full authority in personnel matters police complaints authorities to look into complaints of serious misconduct against policemen at the state level at the district level appointment of dgp by a process which would ensure that a chamcha does not get appointed then all officers on operational duties in the field uh, whether he is a superintendent of police or a sho he should have a tenure of 2 years and then sixth was about separation of uh, investigation from law and order duties in metropolitan towns in big cities and 14 years later nothing has happened uh, i would not say nothing has happened the states are all on the defensive you know all the affidavits they, they have submitted they claim compliance of supreme court directions it is another matter that the compliance is on paper and not on the ground but on paper they are on the defensive and some states uh, things have really improved i mean in the state of telangana last time i went to hyderabad and i mean the man kept on saying sir your judgment has done a lot of good sir we are having two year tenure sir and we are very happy sir I mean, that can. so some states have brought about the transformation but uh, the bigger states have not you see uh, police reforms has now caught the imagination of the people you know while definitely one wants more accountability you know less casteism less communalism less politicization less brutality more better capabilities i mean the the police force like you said it it's it's really like a symptom of everything that is rotting now uh, in our democracy but at the same time i would like you to spell out the difficult circumstances in which they work as well so the conditions are very bad i mean you see uh, the uh, status of policing report published by the common cause they say that an average policeman works for 16 hours a day now that that is uh, i mean you, what do you expect of him and then there are no guaranteed holidays there are no weekly offs i mean it, it this stress and strain tells on him and uh, it affects his family life it also affects his behavior towards the common man uh, then uh, our sub work is one thing then poor very poor housing conditions hardly about uh, th- 35 to 40% of the people have got houses whereas i mean under the rules they 100% should be having quarters so housing facilities are very poor they are living in virtually in slums and uh, uh, i mean they get uh, all the flack for uh, for the failings of the government <laughs> and in the process you see that that the working style has got distorted i mean if, if you have to act under political pressure all the time then i mean it it affects your style and you get criticized for pass, passive uh, reaction in uh, jnu and aggressive action in uh, jamia milia all all those things happen it's all because there is outside pressure all the time you should create an environment where he feels that yes i have the ability to perform and that uh, uh, if i do good things i will be recognized and rewarded and if i get I do bad things i'll be punished so why are we not arriving at a kind of george floyd moment sir you know i mean just this brutal custodial death of uh, jairaj and bnex where they were sodomized and beaten uh, that itself should have been a kind of flashpoint for reform my question in the context of the george floyd controversy is are we waiting for a country wide uh, turmoil Uh, to initiate reforms in the states and at the central level why are i mean why why do we want our hands to be forced tomorrow something like that could happen you never know uh, a small spark may start a prairie fire as mo said so it it could happen even a small incident uh, uh, i mean to corona incident you're, you're quoting you're quoting too much mao for your own good you know i you see I have, I, have, <laughs> i have studied communism so much uh, because i was writing on the naxalite movement in india 
So I have read a lot of communist literature. <laughs> <laughs> it's very dangerous now. So you might have the UAPA invoked against you. <laughs> <laughs> no, but so to go back to your point. Uh, no, so I said, is the government uh, waiting for that uh, explosive moment uh, that there is a country uh, countrywide uh, agitations and disturbances to also police reforms? I mean, why why can't they take uh, why can't they read the writing on the wall and uh, go ahead with police reforms? So you've given a lot of praise to Yogi Adityanath for supporting the police and for giving them freedom. Uh, so then, has he pushed through the kind of reforms that you've been advocating? which would insulate the police and allow them to function without uh, fear or favor? Uh, not, not exactly the kind of reforms that I've been pushing for. But in his own way, he has been trying to clean up the administration. I would not say he has been very successful because, uh, as I said, even a chief minister has limit to his power. And there are all kinds of uh, influences, some of which are corrupt, uh, under, which he has to, under which he has to function. So, so of all the states in India, you've been lecturing, you will seek your advice. Which states would you say are doing a, a more hopeful job than the others? But I think Telangana has done well, Kerala has done well, these states have done well. And uh, some states, even if they have not done well, they have good chief ministers. So things are I mean, in good shape. I mean, like Odisha, you can say. Uh, the maximum problem is in states where the bureaucracy is wooden headed and the strongest bureaucracies in the country that I have seen and experienced are in uh, Maharashtra and UP. Thank uh, you very, very much. I know you're not well. So thank you very much for making the time. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much again for watching inquiry. If you found this interview interesting, do press the subscribe button on the YouTube channel and watch all our other interviews as well. Thank you.